sooner. You know? And even if Solomon had called down from the window and warned him, this kid wouldn't have heard him over the seductive words that actually come next. Look at verse 16. He says, and she says, I have covered my bed with colored linens from Egypt. Yeah. Egyptian cotton, remember? We all like Egyptian cotton for our sheets, right? With that. I have perfumed my body with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let's drink deep of love till morning. Let's enjoy ourselves with love, she says. Now, if you're over 30, you say, wow. If you're under 30, you go, whoa. And just in case he was wondering, she adds, my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He took his purse filled with money and will not be home till full moon. Well, that pretty well cinched it, doesn't it? That clinches it right there. Not only did he not have to worry about her husband catching them, but he could hang around for breakfast. Maybe watch a little TV. Heck, he could spend the entire weekend. This just kept getting better from his perspective, of course. But Solomon saw this situation in an entirely different light. You know, listen to his take, if you will. Verse 21, with persuasive words, she led him astray. She seduced him with her smooth talk. All at once, he followed her like an ox going to the slaughter. An ox? Headed where? Wait a minute. Don't you mean like a celebrity heading into a club? Solomon meant it. It's an ox that's headed to slaughter. It certainly doesn't look that way to the casual observer, but it certainly didn't look that way to our young friend. But Solomon was not finished with this language here. Look at verses 22. He had a few more animals here to add in. Like a deer stepping into a noose till an arrow pierces its liver. Like a bird darting into a snare, little knowing it will cost him his life. And in case you didn't get the ox to the slaughter point, how about a deer stepping into a noose and being shot with an arrow? Or how about Solomon saying this kid was like a clueless bird <laughs> flying around caught in a snare? From his vantage point, Solomon knows that this young man was throwing away his future, possibly his life. And of course, where the young man were the young man able to read Solomon's mind, he would have shouted back, oh, you sound like my dad, right? Besides, what does an old man know about love and passion anyway? This isn't just a date. It's a once-in-a-lifetime event. I'm not an ox. I'm not a deer. I'm not a bird. Just mind your own business, Solomon. At this point in Solomon's narrative, he now turns a corner. And he addresses his broader audience. And the next words are directed at you and me, those who are going to read it next. Verse 24 says, Now then, my sons, listen to me. Pay attention to what I say. Do not let your heart turn to her ways or stray into her paths. That's our word, isn't it? This was a path, not an event. And pay attention to the next observation. Many, verse 26, many are the victims she has brought down. Her slain are a mighty throng. Not a few, but many, he says. Solomon debunks the notion that there was anything unique about what this kid was experiencing. Somehow we think it's unique with us when there's been many that have gone before us on those paths. It may have seemed been unique for him, but his experience represents a well-worn path, a path that leads to death despite what this naive kid may have wanted to argue. And if Solomon could have called a timeout in the story and gotten the kid's undivided attention, he might have said something along the lines like this. Listen, buddy, 
I hate to break this to you, but there's nothing unique or special or rare about this. You have never felt this way before, but a lot of other people have. And if they were here to tell you their stories, you would think twice. You see you're part of a crowd, a herd, a flock. There's nothing new here. And the outcome is all too predictable. She's done more than capture your imagination. She's writing a script for your failure, for your future. Truly, you're a dead man walking. I think that's what Solomon would tell him. Driving home the point, he adds to this. He says, her house is a highway to the grave, leading down the chambers of death. A highway. A five-lane freeway, if you will, with a diamond on the inside. There's nothing new about this, nothing unique. Just another young man who has chosen a path that will take him precisely where he doesn't want or plan to be. You see, there's this disconnect, if you will. The disconnect in Solomon's scenario is easy to see, at least for us. A young man who wanted his life to be relationally richer, chose a path that would ultimately undermine his relationship. A young man who yearned for something good chose a path that led to something not so good. A youth striving to prove his independence chose a well-worn path that had the potential to strip him of his independence. There was the disconnect. Solomon saw it from the window. And I imagine we've both seen similar disconnects from our imaginary window as well, haven't we? So now that we're done talking about this young, impetuous man, young man, going down this path, let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about us for a minute. You see, we all have a tendency to choose paths that lead us where we don't want to go. In a few weeks, we'll look at what causes this apparent lapse in reason, if you will. But for now, I want to focus on how this dynamic plays out itself in our world today. Maybe in our world, some examples might be, be this. A single woman says, I want to meet and, and one day marry a great Christian guy who's really got his act together. But yet, she dates whoever asks her out. You know, as long as it's cute. Or a single guy says, I want a great sex life once I'm married. So he, got that quote there, practices with every girl that he dates along the way. A married woman says, I, I want to have a great relationship with my husband. But she makes the children the main priority over him. Or the husband who says, I want my kids to respect me when they grow up, as they grow up. And then he openly flirts with other women in the neighborhood or at work. Sorry, I went dead on that. Oh, there we go. Or how about the young Christian who says, I want to develop a lasting intimacy with God. And so he gets up every morning and reads his Facebook or his social media. Forgets about the Bible. Or the working man who says, I, I want to grow old and, and invest the latter years of my life in my grandchildren. But then he neglects his health. The regular guy says, I want to get thin and lose weight. But at the counter he says, supersize that, would you? A couple says, we like our children to develop a, a personal relationship with God and choose friends who have done the same. But then they tend to skip church every weekend and head to the beach or sleep in or watch football. How about newlyweds who determine to be financially secure by the time that they reach their parents' age? Aren't we so good when we're young? We're not going to do like our parents did, right? But, that, but then they adopt a lifestyle sustained by debt and they leverage their assets. A high school freshman intends to graduate with a GPA that will afford him options as he selects the college, and yet somehow he thought he was going to get the good grades even though he neglects his studies. 
Surprise. The list could go on and on. You could probably fill in some of your own. And the people my list represent have legitimate goals and oftentimes very good intentions of reaching them. But like this naive young man in Solomon's story, the paths that they choose eventually bring them to a destination that is entirely different from the one they intended. This isn't rocket science. We shouldn't need someone to connect those dots for us. If our goal is to drop two sizes in our clothing, we should eat lunch at the donut shop. Right? If you desire to remain faithful to your spouse, spouse don't linger in an online chat room with members of the opposite sex. Those are not pastimes. Those are pathways. And they lead somewhere else. You know, I've already said it's much easier to see these dynamics at work in other people than it is ourselves. Matter of fact, and right now, you're probably thinking about several people who you wish that you had brought here with you today. So they could hear this message. Because that's who we're talking about. But before you start putting names to those faces in your mind, take a minute to think about your life. And let me ask you this. Are there disconnects in your life? Are there discrepancies between what you desire in your heart and what you're doing with your life? Is there alignment between your intentions and your direction? You see, I think sometimes we think that there is so much in our lives that's just going to happen out for the good. We have to be intentional at what we do. And we have to put ourselves in the right direction. You know, if you've gotten lost while driving, if you tell me you've not, I'm going to call you a liar. You know that if you backtrack far enough, you can usually get your bearings and be on your way. Matter of fact, worst case scenario, or if you're using your GPS, she'll re reroute you and all those sort of things. And I've got more stories about that later with our trip this past week. But when you get lost in life, you can't backtrack. When you get lost in life, you don't waste minutes or hours. You can waste an entire season of your life. Choosing the wrong path in life will cost you precious years, and nobody wants that. Nobody wants to wake up in his 50s and wish that he had taken a different path in his 30s. Nobody wants to arrive at the end of marriage and and wish that she had taken a different path during her dating years. Think about it. You only get to be 20 once. And you only get one senior high school year. You only get one first marriage. The path that we choose at those critical junctions doesn't just determine our destination the following year, but for the following season of life. The principle of the path is, is operating in your life every minute of every day. You are currently on a, a financial path of some kind. You're on a relational path. You're on a path down a moral path, an ethical path, an entertainment path. And each of these paths has a destination. And we have to think about that. What would a guy, though, makes us ask this question, why would a guy like the one in Solomon